Welcome to Swift Coaches Academy, a podcast dedicated to bringing health and wellness professionals the uncensored truth behind what it really takes to succeed in the health industry with me, your host, Zenia Wood. As an accredited exercise physiologist and business owner for almost a decade, I'm on a mission to transform the lives of ambitious health professionals like you who want more and are ready to take action to create incredible impact in your careers and unlock financial freedom in your business. So join me as I speak candidly with industry leaders about the struggles and successes from within the trenches through thought-provoking conversations. Technique. Why do we hold technique to such a high standard? And is it really worth the pedestal it's been put on? Does correct technique reduce pain? Can correct technique improve performance? Why is everyone striving for this ambiguous gold standard of correct technique anyway, when it may not even exist? As a society, we've been ingrained to believe that this technique is good and this technique is bad, and it's our fault. Putting up posts with good versus bad on them, clickbait titles to get you short-term likes and reinforce that people want to see this, but is it really actually helping them to understand? And can we really say with certainty that one technique is better than another? We as the fitness industry are to blame for putting out this information but it's also our responsibility to fix it. So this is my way of doing that, to help you. The coach, the health professional, the mum or dad of children wanting to lift weights, and the individual who has a keen interest in exercise and training. So let's start with the facts. Technique is defined as a skillful or efficient way of doing or achieving something. That definition makes sense from a performance standpoint. The technique is specific to the execution of the task with a desired outcome. For example, if the goal is to squat as much weight as possible, we should opt for a super wide stance, vertical shins, low bar back squat, and hit just below parallel. But if the goal is to increase hypertrophy of the quads, for example, through a squat, you'd likely elevate your heels, go for full depth, and load the bar in a front rack position. These two squats couldn't be more different, but equally, neither of them are wrong or should be labelled as incorrect technique. A second definition I found of technique is a way of carrying out a particular task, especially the execution or performance of an artistic work or scientific procedure. I like this definition because exercise and programming is science meets art. So as long as a task being performed is carried out with the intended technique, with the intention to lead towards a specific goal or target, then the technique is correct for that movement. So it brings me to my next point. Are we really teaching correct technique or just specific movement strategies that we want to implement? After diving into the research, I found quite a lot of articles on technique and to condense the literature today I'm just going to talk about technique as it relates to the back squat in particular. So Delito and Rose in 1992 looked at lifting with an anterior versus a posterior tilt. Note the difference between that and butt wink. So butt wink is when you start in anterior tilt and then tip down into posterior and then come back out of it to come back up. Very different. These guys were squatting uh, anterior tilt the whole way or posterior tilt the whole way. So they found that the erector spinae activation, which is the back musculature, was greater in anterior versus posterior tilt. What they concluded from this was that lifting with this anterior tilt may be beneficial when attempting to lift heavier loads. I also noticed that throughout the literature, specific exercise techniques were rarely labeled as correct or incorrect. And this is likely because the scientific community must fact check rigorously. And if they don't, there's a fear that they might not ever be published as a study. It's a very stark contrast to the guy on Instagram who sounds really smart and apparently gives him automatic rights to say whatever he wants, as if it's come from a peer-reviewed meta-analysis of several relevant randomized control trials. Basically, what I'm getting at is you can't trust all of your sources of information. And the last time I checked... The only prereq for an Instagram account was having your own email address. The contrast between this and the reach search and the general fit pro on social media has a long way to go. And unfortunately, clickbait terms like don't do this or you'll get back pain or the correct way to do a squat is the information that's constantly being perpetuated and fed to the general population who are doing the best they can, but being given very finite views of what is right and what is wrong. 
there's very little gray. Where the confusion takes place and why I have so many people coming to me worried about their technique and wanting to train with correct technique all the time, where I have to go back and unlearn these habits that have been societally ingrained into them. So from the research, I found that Hagen et al. in 1994 looked at technique based on movement efficiency and energy expenditure in a stoop versus a squat to pick up a box. So a stoop being like sort of a hinging movement, whereas a squat is bending at the knees effectively. It showed only slightly higher energy expenditure in a squat, which was determined because of the change of body position, meaning you have to actually lower your entire body and stand back up, whereas just bending forward at the hips with your stoop. Uh, and so this was determined to be the change of body position and not the external load or the box that they were trying to lift. Technique in this case had the goal of movement efficiency in mind, which is the important distinction to make. Once we understand the objective, we can determine if a technique is right for a particular movement or not. There was one study that let me down by Bishop and Turner in 2017, whose title was Corrective Exercises for Excessive Forward Trunk Lean in the High Bar Back Squat. While it addresses some common reasons why the squat is good for athletic development, it didn't really list what good technique actually is or what they're aiming for. And then it suggests reasons or methods on how to correct it. Look, I'm not saying that the concepts weren't great because those are things that I use with my clients, like ankle mobility, cueing to maintain more upright torso, but it really lacked the distinct reasoning behind why these were necessary and why these issues with poor technique needed to be addressed in the first place. Contrasting, De Gruyter in 2018 summarized the current literature by stating that ergonomics have been studied for years with contradictory results, meaning we don't really know if technique is good or bad because it's purpose-driven and movement alone isn't likely to increase your injury risk. Obviously, there's a lot of factors when we talk about injuries. However, there was a comprehensive Cochrane review from 2012 that concluded that training with proper handling techniques, which is basically when you're told bend at the knees, keep the back straight in your training in your workplace, when they're taught that, it actually made no difference to injury prevention of low back pain when compared to giving them no training at all. The literature is also clear when it comes to technique of lifting and whether or not we should be doing this with a flexed spine. It says, and I quote, there is no credible evidence to support the notion that lumbar spine flexion should be minimized during lifting to prevent low back pain. In contrast, it's actually been identified several times that people who do have low back pain use less lumbar flexion and therefore they avoid bending over more than people who are pain free and are moving well in flexion and out flexion. Let me reiterate that point again. There is no conclusive evidence to suggest lifting with a bent or rounded spine will increase your injury risk. None. So this begs the question, why are people always still in gyms lifting with what's perceived to be a flat spine? Side note, even when it appears to be a neutral spine to the naked eye, there can be up to 30 degrees of flexion occurring at any one time. So why don't we intentionally see rounded spine lifting? What has us so conditioned to lift with a straight spine? Well, my best bet is it relates to performance. When we talk technique for injury prevention, there isn't really much literature on it, but there's certainly a whole lot relating to what muscles are recruited and what exercises are going to utilize different muscles at what capacities, what's going to maximize the weight on the bar, bar speed, or using different technique styles. Athletes are great to look at to understand the concept. Most athletes at the highest level perform their exercise technique fairly similarly. There's a reason for that. The specific technique that provides the best outcome, whether it's for a javelin throw, sprinting, or a spike in volleyball, there's a certain technique that's going to be best for that, for throwing further, running faster, jumping higher. So with all this information, I want to conclude with a couple of take-homes. Firstly, words are important. Those tick and flick polarizing dichotomies of right and wrong needs to stop. And it starts with us. 
the health professionals and coaches on the front line of movement prescription. It confuses our clients, it demonizes certain techniques, and it paints a really black and white picture when in reality, there is so much gray area. By adding this noise to social media, we aren't helping anyone but our own egos by thinking that we're right. I completely understand your point of view as a coach myself. It's frustrating to have long-winded conversations about this gray area, but they need to be had. I'll give you a couple of examples of how I've changed my language in recent years. I've gone from, we aren't going to do that because you'll probably injure yourself, to, for your goals, I don't think that's the best option for you right now. I've also changed, don't do that technique, it's bad for your back, to, We should try this instead. This is going to recruit more of the leg muscles than the back muscles. And at the moment, we'd like to take a little bit of load out of your back. So finally, technique is only important as it pertains to your goal. After over 57 comments in the Coaches Academy on technique alone and in-depth discussions with clients and colleagues, I think I found clarity and understanding the purpose of technique and how it sits in this exercise and movement spectrum when we use this term, outcome-driven technique execution. It means exactly what it says. Execute the technique required to achieve the desired outcome. Now, with all that being said, I want to hear from you. What are your questions? What are your comments? What's your feedback? What have you heard from coaches? Do you have a great coach who's talking about technique in this way? Or maybe someone who needs to hear this message? I'd love to hear your feedback. Shoot any questions below. And um, I will see you in the next video. Until then, move swiftly. Did you find something valuable in this episode? If so, I'd like to ask a tiny favor. If you have 30 seconds now, I'd love you to follow or share the podcast. That way we can continue to bring you more real, raw and uncensored stories from industry leaders. We also love hearing from you and what you loved about every episode. The best way to reach out is to DM me personally on Instagram at Swift Coaches Academy. Until next time and in whatever you do, move swiftly.